Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of Design Your Own Airplanes. For those of you who are new to the channel, these videos are dedicated to explaining and demonstrating aerospace engineering principles using simple gliders so that you can design and build your own model airplanes that fly. In this video, we're going to be examining stepped airfoils and we're going to be doing an experiment to see if stepped airfoils can be more efficient than smooth airfoils. Okay, so why are we building airplane wings that look like stairs? Well, to understand how we got to this point, we need to back up a little bit. In our video about basic glider physics, we learned that the ratio of the horizontal distance a glider travels to the vertical distance it travels is equal to the ratio of the lift coefficient to the drag coefficient. This means that to make our planes fly as far as possible, we need to minimize the drag coefficient. In our last video, we learned about the Reynolds number, and we learned that small airplanes flying slowly have low Reynolds numbers, and big airplanes flying fast have high Reynolds numbers. At this point, however, we ran into a problem. It turns out that at low Reynolds numbers, the parasite drag coefficient increases significantly. In this example, using a Clark Y airfoil, a popular choice on model airplanes, we can see that below a Reynolds number of about 100,000, the parasite drag coefficient skyrockets. We can plot the wing cord and speed of our planes and add lines for Reynolds numbers of 100,000 and 200,000. Everything above the 100,000 line is probably fine, but everything below the 100,000 line is impacted by additional parasite drag. This means that our small, slow-flying planes are at a disadvantage compared to larger, faster ones and can't fly as far. So what are we going to do about that? Well, first, let's take a closer look at what's going on here. As we talked about in our video about parasite drag force, there are two main sources of parasite drag. The first is pressure drag, which arises from the force required to deflect air around a moving object. Objects that are blunt have high pressure drag because more force is required to abruptly deflect air around them, whereas objects that are streamlined have low pressure drag because less force is required to smoothly deflect air around them. The second source of parasite drag is skin friction drag, which comes from friction between a moving object and the air. More surface area means there is more skin friction. One idea is to make our airfoils thinner and more streamlined to reduce pressure drag. Thin airfoils, however, are also more flimsy, so this might not always be an option, especially if you're trying to go for a high aspect ratio, like in our induced drag video. So what other options do we have? Well, if we take a closer look at what the Reynolds number actually is, we'll find that it's a ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces. In our context, what this means is that it's a comparison between the significance of the pressure drag and the skin friction. At high Reynolds numbers, pressure drag is dominant, and it is very important that planes be well streamlined. At low Reynolds numbers, however, skin friction drag is dominant. This means that to make our small, slow-flying planes fly further, we need to target the skin friction. This brings us to a design called the Klein and Fogelman airfoil, or the KF airfoil for short. The KF airfoil was developed in the early 1960s by Richard Klein and Floyd Fogelman for use in paper airplane contests. This airfoil is unique because it features a step instead of a smooth surface. Further iterations of the design are referred to as Klein and Fogelman modified airfoils, or KFM airfoils. KFM airfoils are popular in the model airplane community because they're easy to build, they're resistant to stalls, and they can handle strong wind. But of particular interest to us, they also reduce skin friction. But how does this actually work? Let's take a closer look and find out. As air flows over a stepped airfoil, a small pocket of air is trapped behind the step, creating a vortex. This doesn't work well at high Reynolds numbers, which is why we never see stepped airfoils used on full-size airplanes. When air flows over a stepped airfoil, it flows over the vortex as if it were flowing around a smooth airfoil. But here's the important part. There is very little friction between the vortex and the airflow over the stepped airfoil. 
This gets rid of a significant portion of our skin friction, which means that stepped airfoils could potentially be more efficient and make our planes fly farther than smooth airfoils. But will this actually work? Well, I've designed an experiment to find out. In this experiment, we're going to be testing three different wing designs to see which one flies the farthest. Each wing was attached to a simple glider, similar to the one that we built in a prior episode. If you haven't already built one, I've put a link in the description to the build video. These gliders are great for experimenting with different airplane designs because they are inexpensive and easy to build, and it's also easy to swap out parts to see how different designs affect the way the plane flies. The first design was the flat bottom foldover airfoil, which is common on flight test planes. It consists of a flat bottom with a spar to add some thickness. The top piece is then folded over to create a smooth upper surface. The second design was the KFM-2 airfoil. The KFM-2 has one step located halfway back from the leading edge. The third design was the KFM-3 airfoil. The KFM-3 has two steps, one located halfway back from the leading edge and another located three quarters of the way back from the leading edge. In a good experiment, the independent variable is changed and the resulting effects, if any, on the dependent variable are measured. But it is also important that all other variables be kept constant so that they don't skew the results. Each wing had an aspect ratio of 7.5 and each was shaped like a rectangle. Additionally, they all had the same wingspan so that none of them got an extra large boost from ground effect at the end. Each airfoil has a cord length of 4 inches and a height of 0.6 inches, which means that the thickness of each airfoil is 15% the length of the cord. Each wing was attached to the same fuselage and the same tail. Each plane had a wing cord of 4 inches and flew at about 13 miles per hour, which put us at a Reynolds number of approximately 40,000. Each plane was launched from a height of 7 feet and markers were placed along the floor every 2 feet. For the experiment to work properly, it's important that each plane fly on a straight glide slope instead of arcing on a trajectory like a projectile. Video was taken of each flight to ensure that the planes actually did fly in a straight line and didn't stall. The flight distance of each plane was adjusted by moving the trim weights forwards and backwards, and by adjusting the angle of the horizontal stabilizer. Several test flights were conducted to make sure that each plane was optimized to fly as far as possible. A launch ramp was used to ensure ideal launch conditions for each plane. The launcher was mounted on a tripod so that the launch angle could be adjusted to match the plane's glide slope. The launch speed could be adjusted by changing the distance that the rubber bands were pulled back. Launching too fast would cause the plane to steer up, and launching too slowly would cause the plane to steer down. Once the ideal center of gravity location, horizontal stabilizer angle, launch ramp angle, and launch speed were found for each plane, a series of five flight tests were conducted to measure the flight distance of each. The foldover airfoil flew an average of 21 feet with measurements spread over a 4 foot range. This means that the glider traveled about 3 feet horizontally for every 1 foot vertically. To be honest, I was actually surprised how poorly this airfoil performed. Here are more clips where the glider is thrown from a greater height and flies on a very steep glide slope. Fortunately, however, the stepped airfoils performed much better. The KFM-2 airfoil flew an average of 38.2 feet with measurements spread over a 6-foot range. The KFM-3 airfoil flew an average of 38.3 feet with measurements spread over a 3-foot range. This means that the two stepped airfoils each traveled about 5.5 feet horizontally for every 1 foot vertically. In these clips, a glider with a KFM-3 airfoil is thrown from a greater height and demonstrates a much better glide slope than the foldover airfoil. So how do all of these results compare? The full dataset of all 15 flights over all three airfoils is shown here. This chart shows the glide ratio of each airfoil, which is how many units the plane travels horizontally for every one unit it travels vertically. The air bars represent a distance of 6 feet, the greatest range observed in the measurements, non-dimensionalized by the 7-foot height the planes were launched from. 
we can see that the KFM-2 airfoil had a glide slope about 82% greater than the foldover airfoil, and the KFM-3 airfoil had a glide slope about 85% greater than the foldover airfoil. In conclusion, this experiment suggests that at low Reynolds numbers, stepped airfoils have an advantage over flat bottom foldover airfoils because of the reduction in skin friction, and that this enables them to fly farther. There are, however, still several questions remaining. For larger and faster model airplanes with higher Reynolds numbers, at what point will stepped airfoils lose their advantage over flat bottom foldover airfoils? Additionally, if we make the airfoils thinner, so that the steps are smaller, will they still be effective? There are also several other configurations of the KFM airfoil, including the original KF-1, which has a step on the bottom of the airfoil, the KFM-4, which has a step on both the top and the bottom, and the KFM-9, which has three steps. And if we used more advanced manufacturing methods, such as hot wire cutting or 3D printing, to make more advanced airfoil shapes, like the Clark Y, would stepped airfoils still have an advantage? If you have any suggestions to improve this experiment or any other ideas you'd like to see tested, please share them in the comments. Other experiments could include testing using wind tunnels or CFD software to calculate the lift and drag coefficients and try different Reynolds numbers. If you have experience with stepped airfoils and know of any other advantages or disadvantages they have, please share in the comments as well. Well, that wraps it up for this video. We've learned that stepped airfoils can potentially reduce skin friction, and we've done an experiment to show that they can sometimes outperform smooth airfoils at low Reynolds numbers. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more videos on how to design your own airplanes, and thanks for watching.